Hey guys, welcome to another video. You're watching Vol SC. Uh, this time we're going to be going through a bit of a discussion, uh, mainly focusing on strategy and tactics, just purely strategy and tactics. We're not going to be looking at a battle report. We're not going to be analyzing any individual units or factions. Just going to be a straight up strategy video. Um, I'm pleased to say that I've finally gone down and bought um, a, like a desktop microphone. It's sort of sort of sitting here. There it is. There, just hanging out right in front of me instead of having to use the headset. So hopefully that improves quality and makes it a little bit easier to do these videos. So I thought I'd uh, test it out, take it for a spin by talking for a while. Um, now the video, uh, the theme that I'm going to be going through here is about intermediate level play. So if you have just started Infinity, you're assembling your models as we speak, you maybe have played one game or watched a couple of games and had a look at a couple of bat reps, but don't really, you know, feel like you know what you're doing, then this video might be a little bit too far ahead. Um, there was a video I did quite a while back, I'll just find it here, it's called um, Basic Tactics in Infinity. So here it is here. And you can um, just click on the link in the video description if you want to actually watch through this. It's 25 minutes of me just going over some really fundamental basic tactics um, that'll really help you uh, get into Infinity and uh, you know become a better player pretty quickly. So that's um, definitely one thing I'd recommend going for. Um, also, if you are such an advanced player that you're winning tournaments and you've played for a long time, um, I honestly don't think you'll get too much out of this video because I'm trying to speak to people who maybe um, have been to a couple of tournaments before but they're ending up in the bottom half. Um, in your local meta, maybe most of the players are, um, are doing better than you are, so you want to just try and lift your game a bit. Um, again, this is for people who have been playing a little while but not that long. So we'll go into that right um so let me just grab my talking points and we'll get into it so uh first thing i want to go over is um the mental game of infinity and the psychological side of it because i think that's important to start out with a bit of a discussion about that so um infinity is a game of great variance you know things can swing back and forth with the dice more so even than uh, some other tabletop war games if you think about Warhammer 40,000, or at least, you know, the version of 40, Warhammer 40k that I used to play, you pick up a big bucket of dice, which is your squad firing, you know, uh, guns, and you roll to hit, you pick up the hits, you roll to wound, you pick up the wounds, your opponent rolls some armor saves, and all of the outcomes are filtered through this window where you get a result which is more or less expected by both players, and it's not uh, such a huge swing. Of course there are things which go right or go wrong which just uh, turn the game on its head, but the variance isn't as huge as it is in Infinity where you might walk around the corner with a very competent uh, and powerful um, heavy infantry piece with a uh, heavy machine gun and you're firing at some um, you know, uh, sniper or something like that and the other guy rolls a crit and you fail your extra armor save and you just die and you spend your orders doing that and you are just you know, wrecked by that. And... Um, I, I've seen some players who, again, I'm talking about people who are um, less experienced at Infinity, um, really take a psychological hit when things go wrong. I remember playing um, with one guy recently, and I didn't do a bat rip of it, but um, he got so frustrated with uh, you know failing to hit with the smoke grenades, um, certain armor saves going off and not going off, that he just, you know, scooped the whole lot and just, um, you know, picked up and left and didn't even play out the last couple of turns. Even though he was actually in a winning position, I'd killed a couple of things, but I'd failed to kill a lot of things I was supposed to kill, and my position relative to his was quite bad. So just purely on the mental side of things, uh, that was uh, a win instead of a loss. Um, so when you're playing, uh, really, I would say... Because of the D20s and the crits and the type of variance in Infinity, you shouldn't just worry about things going you know, wrong at some stage. You should expect there to be some moments that come up where uh, you really get put at a, at a temporary disadvantage. And I do say temporary because it's possible to come back from that kind of thing. But it's if you are able to sort of just move on and sort of take that hit and cope with it, there's no reason why um, you can't give yourself other opportunities. Just because you lost a very important piece in your army doesn't mean that you know your, your line trooper with a combi rifle might just pop off and kill a lot of things unexpectedly. So you've got to at least give yourself the chance for things to come back. If it's going really badly, just start taking more and more risks. There's no reason to write the game off because, again, if variants got you there, it can get you out of there potentially. So that's the better way to think about it. 
The opposite is true as well. If you're the player whose first turn has gone swimmingly well and you're just crushing the other guy, uh, and then you start to become really complacent and sort of throwing away units and not really sort of contesting things just because you feel sorry for the other guy, and then suddenly the variance just swings it back in their favor and you lose. How stupid do you look there? You've got to keep a level head about it throughout the game, and that's, that's a really important thing to bear in mind. The other thing on the topic of um, psychology and mentality is when you show up for your game and you perceive, you perceive some sort of big difference between your experience and your skill and that of your opponent. I've been playing Infinity pretty solidly and regularly for a few years now and I've played a, a lot. So there are, there are people out there who are less experienced than me, but is it possible for me to lose against those people? Yeah, it is. Do I actually lose against those people? Yeah, I do. I do sometimes. If you put a player like me up against somebody who's super experienced, played all editions of Infinity, uh, winning at Interplanetario, um, maybe the odds would be in their favor because my game, you know, there are some flaws, there are some things I do wrong, and up against a player who uh, barely makes any mistakes, would I be less likely to win? Sure, but could I win? Is it possible for me to win? Yeah, absolutely, because... Um, coincidentally, I might either have really good luck in terms of dice or really good luck in terms of the kind of matchup that it is and the, the mission, or I might come up with some really good ideas in game that give me an advantage and I hold on to that and win. So uh, the worst thing you can do um, at a tournament, for example, is come up against somebody who you feel has a better chance of doing well and just assume the loss, just assume that you're going to get beat. That's a terrible attitude and, and, and outlook to have. So always just simply focus on you know, the models, where are they deployed, where are they going to be moving, what is your opponent doing, what do you have to complete in the mission, and have a bit more of an objective view to it. So that is um, a bit about mentality and psychology. The next thing I want to move on to talk to um, you guys about is about winning conditions. And uh, this is something that comes up in all strategy games. It becomes more important the higher you go and the, the, the greater level you achieve with your play. So um, a winning condition, you know, fundamentally it's just getting more objective points in your opponent in Infinity. But that's not what we're here to talk about. What we're talking about is what sort of position or game state do you need to get things into for you to be assured of having more objective points in your opponent and this is where I think um, beginner players and less experienced players take a lot of things for granted and uh, don't really sort of think about what they need to, need to do to set up that win. I've been talking about it in abstract terms, let's sort of think of a couple of um, examples. So let's say maybe you're playing military orders with Joan of Arc and four Hospitalia Knights and you've got first turn and you need to really inflict some damage otherwise your opponent will find ways of you know, um, out positioning you and hacking you and picking apart your link team. So what you're thinking of doing is getting to a point where several of your opponent's threats are destroyed in their lineup. Maybe one sort of corner of the deployment zone is cleared and you've set Joan of Arc and a crew up in a position where they just don't have enough orders left to, um, you know, counter her and actually go after her and the rest of the game is going to be easy. So the winning condition you're trying to create is that spot where your opponent just doesn't have the resources to respond to your alpha strike. So when you're going through your first turn, all of the decisions you're making, you're evaluating them in terms of how likely are they to achieve that win condition? And that's that's your mental angle towards it. So you're thinking, okay, well, if I head down that side of the table, um, there are some pretty easy kills to get there. And that will allow me to open up some more arrows, uh, some more fire lanes where I can uh, get a couple more kills. And I know that I'm only going to have that many orders left at that point after I've killed those. So I'm going to use those efficiently and set up the crew in a, in a position where, okay, the boarding shotgun and the combi rifle doctor are going to be behind total cover, but I've still got Joan and the HM G to sort of watch these lanes and then the you know the ball will be in my opponent's court and they'll have to, to go after that so that's that's an idea of a winning condition and that's you thinking about how to achieve it let's look look at another example let's say you're playing um, Hakaslam and the mission is a safe area and you've managed to take second turn so you're thinking, all right, well, I'm up against just a pretty generic, you know, Yu Ching list. What I'm going to do is keep a lot of things in total cover. I'm going to have my jammers in positions where he can't really come into my side of the board and attack me very effectively because he doesn't have anything that's immune to uh, isolation. And then I'm going to basically stall the game out and slow it down to a point where I've got my two quadrants and then I can move uh, something expensive like Tariq Mansouri or, um, you know, my Fide or bring in my... Um, 
uh, my reject drop trooper, and I'm just going to make sure I've got enough points in that quadrant over his left hand flank, and that's going to win me the game because I'll have three quadrants to his one. So throughout the game, you're just carefully uh, deciding, you know, when you're moving your troops and deploying them, what's going to uh, allow me to achieve that 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 win condition of that game plan. Um, so the more you're able to think in those terms, in terms of setting up a scenario or a, a, a state of play where you're assured of having more victory points than your opponent or objective points than your opponent, um, that makes it easy to formulate a game plan and decide what to do during your game, and that, that's why it's so important. Speaking of game plan, um, again, uh, I see a lot of games, and myself included, I'm, I'm guilty of this sometimes, where... Um, you're really just winging it, just um, trying to get uh, individual value out of a particular model and then moving on. Um, but it's much better to think in terms of what are you trying to achieve throughout the game, what are you going to do in terms 1, 2, and 3, and think ahead a little bit. Let's say you're playing a really generic um, you know, pan Oceania list that has uh, a Bulleteer and a Kali Spitfire and uh, maybe a NIST Sniper and some specialists, a uh, Crocman, Ford Observer. Well, you might be thinking of it in terms of, okay, I've got first turn. In my first turn, I'm going to send in the Bulleteer with Sister Fire on it and the Akali Spitfire, and I'm going to get as much damage with those two models as I can, and then I'm just going to leave them in my opponent's deployment zone, wait for him to respond by maybe killing them and setting up his position a little bit better. Hopefully, I'll have, I'll have gutted his auto pool a little bit, bit better, because in turn two, I'm going to be setting up my position a lot more. I'm going to be moving um, some of my specialists a bit further towards the middle of the table. My Pathfinder is going to be getting in there. I'm going to be doing some sensor sweeping, because because I want to uh, uncover any hidden deployment models that might jump out in the last turn of the game, and I'm going to basically improve my position through that middle phase. And then in my last turn, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and press the buttons I need to press, get my models into the exact positions they need to be, hopefully contest as HVT, and then uh, bring all of my combi rifles out of total cover and uh, basically provide arrows. So on the opponent's last turn, they're going to have as difficult uh, a time as possible uh, counteracting that and um, you know overcoming those objectives. So from the outset, you've already got a, an idea in mind as to what you want to want to achieve. So you're less likely to be sending off models on tangents that is not really going to uh, amount to much and go after enemy uh, targets that aren't really going to help you actually win. So uh, that's that's thinking about game plans. Next up, um, I want to say a few things about list building, but this video isn't really going to focus on list building. Um, I've got a uh, another video actually on YouTube called uh, General List Building Theory, and again, link will be in the video description. And maybe have a look at that, because in this video I'm spending about 35 minutes talking about how to create a solid, well-rounded list which covers a number of different roles. You want to make sure you have a model which is capable of clearing out an arrow piece. You may want an arrow piece of your own. You may want something which attacks quickly and moves over to the other side of the table quickly because sometimes an opponent will just hide everything in total cover. So you've got to have an answer to that. So if you uh, start writing lists in a bit more, more of a structured way, that's going to uh, solve a lot of problems for you. And, and uh, honestly, if you don't really come along with a, a really well-rounded list, um, a lot of this other stuff I'm going to be talking about will be really difficult. Um, next up, we'll talk about a bit about mission objectives and analyzing them. Um, I would really recommend that before you go over to your casual game, you know, you're going to go over to your friend's house or they're going to come to you or you're going to go to your local gaming store. Um, when you're organizing your game on your know, text messaging or Facebook or whatever, maybe um, work out what mission you're going to play first. Also, when you're going to a tournament, there'll, there'll obviously be some missions already, you know, prepared for you. So, study them. Um, have a look at them. So, before you before you even get into your game, you should have actually had the, the chance to actually read through and take a number of different things into account. Are the deployment zones normally where they are? What are the measurements of where the consoles and objectives are going to be? Just make sure you've got a, a, like a mental idea of, of that. Um, what is contributing most of the objective points to winning or losing? Uh, which of the objective points are going to be easy to accomplish, which aren't going to be easy to accomplish? 
the list that you've been writing, which of your models are going to be doing the scoring, which models are most likely to be the data tracker or going to be babysitting the Xenotech. So if you've spent some time thinking about this stuff and planning this stuff, I, I know a lot of this may seem obvious, guys, but there are actually a lot of sort of beginner players who aren't doing this and they're showing up for games and uh, having a really difficult time. But if you've spent you know, a fair bit of preparation on this, it actually becomes a lot easier when you're in the game to decide what your plan's going to be and what you're going to be doing. I've just randomly uh, pulled up Engineering Deck here, so having more connected consoles at the end is worth 5 points. So that's, that's generally the, um, the, the winning condition of this. So without uh, paying too much attention to the peripheral stuff that you may or may not be doing, the idea is to make sure that you've got units which can reliably press the buttons on the console and uh, preferably have the opportunity to go over to your opponent's side and press the ones over there as well because that's going to make it even harder for them to win. And also maybe a bit of a game plan for defending the, the the middle room, right? Because that's where the central objective is going to be. If you've got units with crazy koalas or mines, mad traps, uh, if you've got decent hacking, um, direct template weapons, just think think about funneling some of your, some of your units into the middle across the, the center line as well. Because if you can prevent your opponent from coming in and, and, and responding to that, then the game's going to be a lot easier, isn't it? But the main point uh, it, there is, is really just to analyze the objectives as much as you can, the, the mission scenario as much as you can before uh, the game or the tournament. So that will help you out a lot. All right, next up, here's one thing I get asked about a fair bit, and that is a deployment. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking about deployment because this can be an easy way of improving your game if you've really just got no idea what you're doing. So this is a game that I played very recently. You guys saw the bat rep. It was Akari against uh, Yu Ching, and it was a draw. Um, and I was to deploy my Akari on this side of the table. So we'll get out of um, a pen, and we'll just observe that the deployment zone comes out to a roundabout here. And here's the, the baseline of the table. So you've got a 12 inch strip with which to deploy things. Now, I don't know about you, but when I show up to play my game, uh, if my opponent is deploying first, I like to keep all of my models inside my, my carry case or whatever I've got there. No, none of my models are actually out on the table. And uh, you let your opponent deploy all of their models first, except for the reserve trooper, and then you start deploying. You don't really want your opponent looking at the models that you're going to deploy because that will give them an edge, edge right? Now, I don't do this, but I have seen a few people deliberately bring models out of their carry case that they're not going to be using the game at all, just to throw their opponent off. I don't know if you want to do that. I don't really do that myself, but it can be a thing sometimes to take out your avatar or whatever it is and your opponent um, maybe you know, starting to wonder whether they're going to be up against that. But my point is that you don't need to show any of that information if you don't want to while your opponent's deploying if they're going first. But if it is your turn to deploy... What I do is I take out all of the models in one group, so group one, just put them down next to the deployment zone. Then I take out all the models which are gonna be in group two, put them over here. Um, bear in mind that um, that's actually closed information until after the reserve models go down. So if you don't want your opponent to know which models are in which group before the reserve model comes out, then maybe don't do it the way I do, just put them in a big cluster. But you know, whatever works. The, the point is that I like to do a check to make sure I'm actually remembering to deploy all of my models. Uh, sometimes you know you may forget to deploy something and also um, to avoid deploying something that's not supposed to be there because it's really embarrassing when you have to take something off the table when it wasn't really in your list but the reason I like to have all of the models just right there in front of me visually is because I go through a bit of a system where I'll be thinking okay let me deploy the models with the least flexibility about where they can be positioned first so if you look at this deployment zone, I've got the Pangwilling Evo repeater in the right-hand side. There aren't really too many places where it can go. If you deploy it around here, there's a little bit of an angle through here where your opponent can shoot at it. Likewise, over here, there are ways to come around. But if you put it over, over this side, then um, you've at least got models here to defend uh, things coming around through there. It can at least hack uh, something coming on uh, this, this spot. And it's generally going to be relatively safe. So you deploy that first. And then you move on to models which have a little more flexibility with where they can be. Um, also, if you have a model which is a hacker, you should really uh, 
pay a lot of attention to what you're um, what you're putting the, the assisted fire uh, buff onto if that if it's that kind of hacker and if you have repeaters try and spread them out so in my case here's the pangolin here I've got a sensor bot which is a repeater and a, um, a fugazi which is a repeater uh, this particular list doesn't really have anything that's going to benefit from assisted fire except for the rushi which has got it which has got its own repeater but let's imagine you were going to deploy something that didn't have um, a repeater on it. Let's say we're going to put down a, um, a TR bot right there. Well, it's important that we have this repeater nearby so that, you know, assisted fire can go down in it. So that's that's another thing to bear in mind when you're deploying. Next up, um, if you've got a doctor, obviously that's going to go next to the thing that's going to need the, you know, revival the most. So there's the Tanko missile launcher there. Um, one thing which is you know, maybe a bit of a misdeploy here is that if your opponent's got any uh, template weapons, like my opponent does in this game, um, Hacktile Missile Launcher, it may maybe sometimes better to put the Doctor a bit further away, out of template blast range, and then you can actually crawl over and revive it later. That's what I normally do. So if you can keep the Doctor out of line of sight of the thing that's going to be reviving, all the better. But unfortunately, this was a bit of a NAF deployment zone, and there's only a thin wall there, and the Doctor can't really hide anywhere else that it's, it's not going to be seen from something shooting down from that building. Uh, speaking of which, when you're deploying, just watch out for the fact that if there are some large raised buildings in the middle of the table like this one, and your opponent, uh, sorry, your model may be on a rooftop like this one over here, um, if they deploy some sort of infiltrating model with um, a decent gun, you might get shot from the rooftops. So if you're worried about that, maybe deploy in total cover behind these, these obstacles around here. Um, next thing I like to consider in deployment is, um, you know, the corners. So if you look at these spots here, these are edges where your opponent is going to move and sort of move around and if you can if you've got direct template weapons it's a really good idea if you have them that is to try and deploy them in spots where they are going to be the first things to see models coming around the edge and uh, when they do come around the edge of the corner they'll come straight into range of your heavy flamethrower or your chain rifles so that's, that's the best place to put them. If you're deploying impetuous models in that particular way, well, just be aware that the four inches may take you around the corner. It might be better to bring them back further around here where the four inches won't t quite, quite take you uh, past the wall and into uh, line of sight of your opponent's snipers. So that's um, uh, where you'd put warbands and things like that. Um, when it comes to the reserve model, it depends often whether I'm going first or second. So if I'm going first, um, the model that I'm going to be using to race over their table edge and attack will probably be the, the reserve model. Obviously, an, an impersonator might be as well. If you're attacking with your drop trooper, then that may be not as important because it doesn't actually appear in deployment uh, at the start. If I'm going second and I've got a really um, vulnerable lieutenant at option, it's a very uh, obvious lieutenant option, and they're likely to have an impersonator since they're playing Shazvasti or um, you know Hakistan or something like that. I might use the lieutenant as a reserve model to put it somewhere safe because I'm having the last, you know, I'm I'm, I'm playing my card last, so to speak, with with the reserves. Um, again, you might be playing a list which has a very uh, you know important model to defend, like a tag. A lot of players use their tag as the reserve model, but bear in mind you don't necessarily have to if you feel like you're going to be in a matchup where they don't really have anything that can just shoot the tag or assassinate it. So if there's only one position on the table, like maybe here, where, oh, let me just get out the pen again, where the tag's going to be safe, if that's the only spot behind, you know, a big piece of total cover, then maybe just chuck it down there anyway, because there's nowhere else it can go, and it doesn't really benefit from being the reserve model in that way in some cases. So just try to think about what kind of things can your opponent's faction do, what kind of things does that particular player like if you know a bit about your opponent, and use that information when deciding where to put your models and in what order to put them down in. Um, don't forget that um, if a model can go prone, it probably should. Um, you really want to limit the ability for your opponent to gain line of sight to a lot of your stuff unless it deliberately wants to see the enemy. And even in that sort of case, it's possible to watch the table while standing prone anyway. Uh, prone is such an easy um, you know, ability to abuse. You know, standing up, standing down, it doesn't take any uh, actual movement. So that's a really good idea. If you're deploying a link team as well, just make, make sure that they're not going to be too vulnerable to speculative fire. Make sure also that if you decide to change the link leader from the middle guy to somebody else around the edges, that all models will still be in um, coherency. 
you don't want to have a position where okay you've got your kaisatsu link team and there's one guy here one guy here and then one over, uh, guy over here and then for some reason you need to make this model the link leader to shoot things and that puts this model out of you know coherency so if you're playing a sectorial don't fall into that trap and also if you're going second and you've got your link team maybe make the link leader one of the guys back in total cover rather than the guy watching the table because if your link leader gets shot the whole team loses all of the bonuses whereas if you just lose one member you've still got some some benefit there with six ends level two and the extra burst so that's about it for um uh deployment that's i mean there's more to say about deployment but those are some basics i just wanted to cover off the next thing I want to go on about is um, uh, things to do with what I call reach and a concept I, I've named here myself, I've coined it, um, but it's more to do with threat ranges. So if you think back to um, games other people might be familiar with like Warhammer 40,000 or War Machine of Hordes, you've got units there which can move once per turn in most cases and to shoot a certain distance once per turn. Whereas Infinity, you can keep spending orders on a guy to continue moving around the table, and you can cover a lot of dif distance, and also your gun doesn't necessarily have a maximum range, it just has an effective range. So it's a lot more fluid and open-ended uh, in terms of what you can achieve. Having said that, really important tip, which I think will help beginner players get to that intermediate level is being able to anticipate how much effort it's going to take to do something how likely it is to to get something across the finish line in terms of results and uh, what the game state is going to be after your turn um, I like to count up and just visualize across the table how many orders it's going to take for me to do something if it's something which is going to require a lot of orders so let's say you've got um, your main order group. It's been cut down by two orders from your opponent's command token, strategic use. You've got eight orders to go and commit an alpha strike with. Maybe you've got a heavy infantry model or a bulleteer or a tag or something to attack with. You should bear in mind how many orders is it going to take to get into line of sight of your opponent's first target. If they haven't deployed anything that's really watching the table all the way across your deployment zone, well, it might take two or three orders to get over there. Bearing in mind, you might you might be trying to avoid certain fire lanes. You may be trying to avoid what might be a, a hacker. You might uh, be trying to ensure that you retain cover at the point you actually start shooting them. So these things need to be calculated. You don't really have eight orders of just killing enemy models. It might be two to three orders of getting into position. Uh, three or four orders of just shooting at, at easy targets. Bearing in mind... Uh, you may not get a kill with every individual order spent. They may get a critical dodge, or you might just whiff a lot of shots, or they might win uh, the face-to-face -face roll entirely. But also, once you've gone over there and you've spent six or seven orders, are you willing for that model to just die completely, or are you just leaving there? If it's such an important model, like a tag, for example, you may be moving out, getting a couple kills, and then spending a few orders moving back. Otherwise, they might hack you and possess your tag. So, um, by the way, this is one reason why I tend not to do that with the tag at the start of the game, but the tag may be moving out later in the game anyway. So, the, the point really, and I think I've already made the point, is that try and just count up realistically how many orders it's going to take to get over there. Also, towards the end of the game, if you've got an objective to complete, like in the case of this game, uh, rescue, how many orders is it going to take you to get into the exclusion zone? Are you factoring in difficult terrain? Um, are you factoring in that you might not pass the willpower check when you go for the objective? Are you factoring in how many moves it's going to take for you to move that, that civilian to safety? If it's comm center, okay, your opponent may have four objectives, you may only have two, so that's only two willpower checks you need to pass, but how many orders is it going to take to get to the objectives? Are you going to need to go prone and move at half speed at some point? Are you going to need to kill a couple of things before you can move out your specialist? So always be thinking about, um, you know, the realistically, you know, real terms, how much effort is going to put into something, and whether or not something's going to just appear to throw you off. So let's say you're playing Hak Islam and are playing against Hak Islam and uh, you've got a lot of reason to believe they may be hiding a Tureg sniper somewhere around there. Um, your count that you're doing may not really be watertight um, if you're not factoring in you know, the Tureg sniper appearing halfway through your run of orders and sniping you, forcing you to take you know, evasive action and hide your model or maybe take uh, a cautious move that you didn't really want to take. So um, maybe leave yourself a little bit of room for accounting for that kind of thing, yeah? 
tasks. That's what I mean by by reach, really, and, and threat range. It's not just about what you can achieve sort of on paper, but uh, you know what's actually going to happen on the battlefield. When people are designing lists and reviewing armies and factions, you're always doing that on paper in a vacuum, and you're thinking, well, here's your link team with your badass HMG in it, and you know it's going to kill everything that it looks at. But then when you actually show up and look at the table, well, you still need to deploy it uh, somewhere uh, safe. You need to find the right range band. Some of the, the sight lanes on the table may not you know, benefit you. You may be assuming you're moving directly from a 12-inch point from your baseline of the table, but the only available deployment spots might be a little bit further back, so you might be moving you know, further forward. And that's why in Infinity, having a list which includes a little bit of infiltration, a little bit of this long-range gun, a little bit of this mid-range gun, some warbands, some chain rifles, maybe a little bit of hacking, and having that balance of abilities is what uh, serves players who play well. Whereas, you know, coming up with a list which is a bit skewed and does well on paper, provided the, the, the terrain and the distances and the matchup and the, the scenario work out for you, is not as good an approach. Um, I think, uh, I don't want to spend too long this video, but I, I just want to finish off by rounding this out and talking about order pools and, and using groups. Um, you see a lot of players try to aim for that sweet spot of between sort of 14 to 16 orders. If you bring in a, a list which has a 10 order group and two orders uh, backing it up, you're in a situation where you're still vulnerable to um, the command token reducing your main order uh, group by two, and your secondary pool... Um, can't actually go out and achieve anything meaningful. It might just be there to shoot an arrow or doctor somebody or put down assisted fire. Whereas if you're showing up with an order pool of uh, 10 and say 5 or 6, then you can commit to your main game plan with the first order pool and go out and kill things and, and have quite a lot of reach because you've got 8 to 10 orders to go and do something significant. But you're still getting a lot of mileage with your secondary order pool because there are some jobs which only require a few orders. So one really common example of that is where you're maybe you're playing Yuqing and you've got a Gulang, a Guilang um, Ford Observer in your second group. Well, in your first group, you're moving your Hak Tao, your, um, your Rushi or whatever it is that's gotta be doing a lot of work. And then in group two, uh, once you've done a bit of damage and killed some ARO pieces, that four or five orders, you get a lot done with that Guilung because it's able to press a button straight away, lay some mines, go back into camo state, and really, um, you know, increases your presence on the board quite a lot without needing sort of eight to ten orders. Whereas if you had that Guilung in a group uh, where only it was two models, then maybe you press the button and fail it and you try again and maybe you pass it, but the Guilung's just sitting there, no mines, it hasn't got back into camo state. So just think about in those terms, when you're designing lists, Either you're going full bore limited insertion where your opponent just can't take that two orders away from you and you're going to have a really robust quality list and you're going to have some really crushing alpha strikes or you're going for a lot of models where you've got a, a secondary pool of at least four or five. You're able to actually do things significant with that second group and um, and be efficient about it. It's also easier to plug gaps when you've got, say, 15 or 16 uh, orders uh, total is that your secondary group, you can move a couple to group one and still do a little bit with it um, in that sort of limited uh, pool function there. Don't forget also that if you're playing a list where you've got 10 regular orders in the first group, four regular orders in the second group, and a couple of irregular orders, that you've got that, that versatility there where you can spend command tokens to convert irregular orders into regular orders in your second group and increase the, the, the reach and the, the threat of what that group can do if you need to, but if you don't need to, then the irregular orders just go do their own thing. You keep your command tokens for coordinated orders later on. And um, this is something people do a lot and it's very, very efficient. So try and study that kind of setup a bit more if you're new to Infinity when you're designing army lists, especially if factions that have availability of a lot of irregular orders. Just try and um, see if you can come up with some lists which go for that sort of composition. You know, you've got 10 regular orders in group one, or maybe nine regulars and one irregular. And then in group two, maybe four to five regular orders and one or two irregular orders. And um, I mean, obviously just make sure you've still got that, that thing to clear enemy models with an HMG perhaps. Uh, got something fast which can get to their deployment zone. You've got enough specialists, you've got enough support. Maybe you've got a doctor and a hacker. And just spread your abilities out um, and think about 
think about how you're going to achieve your winning winning conditions, how you're going to come up with a game plan, and uh, execute that efficiently because you've you know you've got the support to to go ahead. Oh, that was a really rambly video. Really enjoyed just talking about strategy in general. Um, maybe in future I'll take this a bit further and talk about some tactics which are a little bit more advanced than this. But again, this has been, uh, in my opinion, an intermediary look. Don't forget to check out uh, basic, you know, primitive tactics in Affinity if you are really, really new. And um, if you need to know a bit more about uh, designing army lists, do check out my other video um, about general list building. But for now, hope you guys are enjoying the sound of the new mic, that it's um, the audio is coming across a bit better. And I'll see you next week for some more bat reps.